comedian Flip Wilson, he used to introduce a skit on the show Laughing where he'd come on stage dressed in the black robes and powdered wig of a judge. And as he was coming out, he'd say, if you remember this, say it with me, here come the judge, here come the judge, order in the court, cause here comes the judge. <laughs> How many of you remember that? <laughs> Some of you do, right? And then some hapless defendant would come out before the judge to have his case heard. Well, today we're finishing the message series, The Thrill of Victory. I want you to open up your Bible or your smartphone to Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. We're going to be in Matthew, first gospel in the New Testament, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. As we consider yet one more truth that is tied to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now, resurrection means heaven and hell are real. And the Bible teaches us that there will come a time when our resurrected Lord will return to this earth to usher in eternity, and he will preside over the court of final judgment. And in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, we see Jesus. He's sitting on his throne. He is serving as the sovereign judge over everyone who ever lived. Jesus depicts this as a time when the sheep will be separated from the goats. Now, we're not referring to literal farm animals here, but he is pointing to the time when all people from around the world will somehow, some way, be brought before him alive and fully conscious, conscious for a time of final judgment. You know, it's popular to watch courtroom drama these days, shows like Judge Judy or People's Court. How many of you ever watched those judge shows? You know, those can always be kind of interesting, even kind of hilarious, sometimes kind of cringeworthy. But, but then many, how many of you are familiar with all the ridiculous drama of the divorce and defamation proceedings between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, you know? I mean, I don't bring this up to make fun of them or to be judgy, but it's just been in the news a lot lately, all the drama going around with that and uh, the sordid details of violence and horrible behavior and video footage of these ugly and embarrassing arguments going on between them. He's suing her for $50 million. She's suing him for $100 million. On a more serious note, who's not aware of the controversy and uproar surrounding the leaked U.S. Supreme Court draft opinion pertaining to Justice Samuel Alito's statement on the Mississippi abortion case, which could overturn Roe versus Wade at that federal level. Doesn't necessarily outlaw abortion, but it would leave the decision about this issue up to the states to decide. And, and, and people debate whether or not the unborn are human life that should be protected or whether the issue is a matter of choice about controlling one's own body. The courts are making important decisions that affect our lives all the time, aren't they? Their judgments impact us. Their judgments influence what goes on in our culture. There will be, however, no more important time of judgment than that which will occur at the end of time as we know it. When Jesus returns, final judgment and eternity are ushered in. Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 through 33 says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. At that time, Jesus will show supernatural discernment. His conclusions will not be confused or wrong. Nobody will be able to change his final judgment by protesting outside of the gates of heaven. What he decides at that time with regard to our eternal destiny will be right and righteous. It will be loving and it will be characterized by his integrity. As Jesus talks about this final judgment, he notes that his discernment concerns the destinies of sheep, that is, those who know him, and goats, those who do not. Now, Jesus' point is not to say that sheep are somehow more righteous than goats, like sheep are good and goats are bad. He's not picking on goats. He's not saying that they're bad or they're ugly or anything like that. Instead, Jesus is simply creating this image 
in the mind's eye that people of his day and age would immediately be able to relate to. Palestinian sheep and goats often looked similar from a distance and they often grazed together during the day. But at nighttime, they needed to be separated because the goats required a warmer place to rest than the sheep. And so Jesus' point in all of this is just to say that at the end of time as we know it, there will come a judgment of each individual. How many times do you think about that? At the end of time as we know it, there will be a judgment of each individual. The final judgment is real, even though it seems so far off. What we have to keep in mind, though, is that our eternal destiny depends on our choices and what we do right now. There are one of two places where we end up in eternity, according to the Bible. As Jesus talks about this, and he tells us that heaven is the place where followers of Jesus reside. Heaven is. Matthew 25, 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Heaven is a place of peace and wholeness. It's, it's the place where God is present forever and where sin and its impact are not present. It's the place of our eternal inheritance. It's the place of our eternal reward, of light and completeness. All that we have hoped for is now realized there is no disease or pain there. There's no crippling problems. There's no death. There's no tears. There's no darkness. There is no ending. Scripture tells us that all of these former things that seem so natural to us right now, they will have all passed away. And I think that's an interesting thing to comprehend. Because when we think of pain and we think of suffering and decay and death, we think of that as natural, don't we? Death and dying is natural. And it's part of creation's natural way of cycling through. But in God's way of looking at all of that, those things are unnatural. In other words, that's not how the natural order was originally created to be when we read back in, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 when God put it all together to begin with. In fact, sin is what messed it all up. And that's why Jesus had to come. That's why him coming and dying for our sins and rising in the resurrection is so significant and important. And I think it's interesting how we so often get things wrong. You know, we misunderstand the significance of what's going on. We want what we shouldn't have, and we don't want what we should. That's why it's important to see life and all its issues through the eyes of God, as best we can, through the Bible's message. I heard a story about a couple of guys who were both avid baseball fans, and these guys didn't just like baseball, they lived baseball. They breathed it and ate baseball. And when they weren't at work and all tied up by chores at home, they were either attending a game or they were watching it on TV or they were coaching some little league game out in the park. One day, one of them wondered about whether there would be baseball in heaven. And quite a conversation ensued about that. One guy says, you know, everything's perfect in heaven, isn't it? We'll want for nothing, Right. Surely there's going to be baseball in heaven. And they thought about that. And so they wanted to know so badly if there was going to be baseball in heaven. But they made this pact with one another that whoever got to heaven first would somehow try to contact the other and let them know for a fact whether they had baseball there. Well, eventually one of the friends did die and it was a kind of a sad occasion. But a week later, he appeared to his buddy in a dream. And I know that doesn't really happen. But that's for the sake of the story. Just follow along. A week later, his buddy appeared in a dream, and he says, well, you know, I have good news, and I have bad news. And the good news is, there is indeed baseball in heaven. And, and the guy's ecstatic, and he's saying, if that's the case, I can't imagine why there would be bad news. And then his dream continued. The bad news is, you're scheduled to pitch this Saturday. <laughs> good news and bad news. You know, sometimes... We think of heaven as a boring place where there's nothing to do. But from what I can gather about heaven, it comes in two phases. First, before Jesus returns for the final judgment, when we die, our spirit that gives our bodies life, it leaves these broken bodies and it resides in a place where either God is present 
or where he is absent. And then the second phase of heaven becomes quite literally a physically renewed earth where sin is gone after Jesus returns. We read of the earth being purified in 2 Peter. We read of heaven coming down to settle onto this earth at the end of Revelation. This is the time when our spirit rejoins our newly resurrected bodies at the final judgment which Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15. And just as Jesus became physical in a new way in his body at the resurrection, so will we. And I think there are going to be all kinds of wonderful things to do, like what we do now, only better. The young girl was walking with her dad one evening when the rays of the setting sun were shining across the skies and it was lighting up the clouds in brilliant colors. With more insight than she even realized, she said to her father, Daddy, if the wrong side of heaven is so beautiful, what do you think the right side of heaven will look like? <laughs> That's a good question, isn't it? I really believe we can't imagine right now how beautiful heaven is going to be and how fun the things are that we enjoy now are going to just be enhanced and the colors and everything else when we get to heaven. And God renews things and there's no longer sin impacting and influencing and taking away from the good creation that God had made for us. Take music, for instance. We can't even imagine right now how beautiful music will be in heaven. We listen to our favorite song right now and we think, oh, I don't get any better than this. This song better be in heaven. <laughs> I'm almost certain that heaven's music is going to be bluegrass. <laughs> and maybe some Celtics thrown in. But honestly, I know that I'm going to be surprised at how much better music will be in God's eternal heaven on a sin-free earth. And it's probably going to be all styles, except heavy metal. That probably won't be there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Or rap. No, I'm just kidding. But seriously, heaven is the place where followers of Jesus reside. Whatever the details of it all end up looking like. And always keep in mind, heaven is something we inherit because of our relationship with Jesus. We cannot earn our place in heaven no matter how hard we try. We're, we are undeserving because our sin has already marked us as doomed, right? Right? You know, we, sometimes people go, you're a loser, you know, back in the day. Really, what we have on our foreheads is doomed. We are all doomed for hell, but for the grace of Christ. And it is a gift to us provided by the one who went before us, the one who says he is the way, the truth, and the life, the one who lived perfectly and says to us, it is the kingdom of heaven I have prepared for you. And he talks about this mansion, this house, right? <clears throat> Nevertheless, there is a connection between being saved and living like it. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 through 40, Jesus says this, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine and sisters of mine, you did for me. How do you know a Christian when you see one? You know, Jesus seems to be saying that you look to see how they live. And I don't think he's being creepy. I don't think he's telling us that, you know, we need to troll people and we need to be judgy against them. He's not saying that anyone can somehow earn their way into heaven by doing good things. He's simply saying that we tend to live what we believe, don't we? And we know that's true. It's like how James, the brother of Jesus, would later write in James chapter 2, verses 21 through 26, saying that the Christian's faith and actions work together and are inseparable like two sides of a coin. You really can't have one without the other. James says that just as the body without the spirit is dead, so is faith without deeds dead. Our faith is made complete by what we do. And there is this connection between being saved and living like it. And so we want to live with intentionality in order that we care about the same things and we care about the people that God cares about. 
And so why be intentional about that? Because eternity isn't just for people living in heaven. Eternity is also for those who will live in the place where God is not present. Hell is the place where those who reject Jesus' lordship reside. And so in Matthew 25, 41, Jesus says, Then he'll say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. We don't like to think about hell, but we dare not ignore it. You know, I still remember the time when I was just a little kid and my aunt was babysitting my brother and me. And she said, I can believe in heaven, but I don't believe in hell because I don't think that a loving God would actually send someone to an awful place like that. And you know, you think about that and it makes sense at first. I wished that were true, but it's not. I can't just accept the parts of the Bible's message that I like and leave out the parts of the Bible's message that I don't like. And this is an interesting verse of the Bible because... In one sense, my aunt, though she's wrong, she might not be all that far off because this verse tells us that hell was not originally intended for people. Do you see that? Hell was not originally intended for people. Who was it intended for? Satan and his angels. Hell was the place prepared for the devil And his angels is what Jesus says, who rejected him, who rebelled against God. But now the space for hells had to be enlarged because some people have chosen to reject the salvation Jesus offers. And their sin still separates them from God. Those who are cursed will be there in hell. Those who have lived and finished their earthly lives without Jesus because they didn't want to have anything to do with him will be residing there. The place where God is absent is not pleasant. This isn't what God wants for anyone. Nor does the fact that some reside in hell mean that God doesn't love them. What else can God do for you if you make the decision that he's not going to matter to you? You see, God loves people so much that he put on flesh in Jesus. He died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. He rose in the power of the resurrection, showing himself capable of being our savior. God loves us so much that he prepares heaven as a place where we can live with him forever, according to John 14, verses 1 through 4. And God loves us so much that if we choose not to live with him, or if we choose to not live for him, he's not going to force us to do that. And the place where we can live eternally without him is called hell. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 8 and 9, Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. When you reject God's love, his authority and presence, something very hideous starts to happen. You begin to assume the character of Satan who did the same thing, even if you can't see that happening right now. Shane Wood, who was one of the speakers at this year's Michigan Christian Convention, he noted how just as when you drink water or you eat food, you in, what you ingest is what you become. And so too, that's true for us spiritually. You know, you, you drink water, right? And, and right now we're two separate things, but I drink water and what happens? We become one, right? What you ingest is what you become. And so when it comes to us spiritually, if you're ingesting the righteousness of God, it becomes a part of you. You know, things like his message and things like the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But if you never go to God's well to drink, You only drink the things that are secular and they're wrong or they're off kilter or maybe you think it doesn't really matter what you drink because you're a pretty good person compared to those around you. It's going to impact you and what you become and where you reside in eternity. And so there is a connection between our priorities and our worldview. Whatever shapes your thinking will decide what you do. And so the question is, 
Is your thinking being shaped by God's messages and purposes? Or is it being shaped by something else? Because Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 25, verses 42 through 45, I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me. And I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. And they will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry <clears throat> or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and we did not help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then the section ends with verse 46, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The only reason why this is true is because the resurrection of Jesus is real. He is alive and he desires that we reflect his light into a world that is dying. Story is told about a Norwegian fisherman and his two sons who were out on their daily fishing run. By mid-afternoon, a sharp, brisk wind was whipping salty spray into the faces of this sea-hardened man and his two sons. As the wind increased, the waves grew into these gigantic, threatening swells, and it got dark outside. And that little boat pitched back and forth as these three attempted to get back to shore. And the storm was so fierce that it washed out the light in the lighthouse that was on shore, leaving these fishermen dependent on just kind of groping guesswork. They just had to kind of guess where the shore was. Meanwhile, on shore, in their rustic cottage where their wife and mother was waiting for them to get back home, a fire broke out in the house. Unable to put it out, the woman watched as the flames just destroyed their home and wiped out every earthly possession that they had. When the father and sons finally made it safely back to shore, she was waiting for them with this tragic news. And even as she told her husband of the terrible fire that destroyed their home and all of their possessions... He seemed strangely unmoved by the loss. And then he said to his wife, A few hours ago, we were lost at sea. We were fighting fierce wind and these high waves. Our only guide to the shoreline was the lighthouse on the cliff. And then it went out. And I was certain we would die. And then I noticed a dim yellow glow out in the distance. And we turned our boat and we moved towards that light because we were headed farther out to sea before then. And that light grew brighter and brighter, and we followed it safely to the shore. And then he said, you see, Ingrid, that little yellow glow was the first sight of our house on fire. At the peak of the blaze, we could see the shoreline bright as day. The same fire that destroyed our house created a light that saved our lives. My friends... The resurrection of Jesus matters because we're on the sea of life and all the lights are out and our ship is going down. And the only way to get to shore is the light of the resurrection. Death is real and judgment is sure. It is inevitable. We must all reckon with hell. But the good news is this. Heaven is available to all who believe, who will repent of their sins and turn back to God, who will profess Jesus as their Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and who will be united with him in the waters of baptism. His resurrection is the light of our future. Through the tragedy of a burning house, a family was saved. Through the tragedy of our crucified Jesus, we have a risen Savior. Amen? Amen. And because he lives... We also live. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for Jesus, our risen Savior. God, we know that we belong to you because of him and his work on the cross. We know that we can trust in that message because he resurrected from the dead. He is now alive. And Lord, we give you the glory and the honor for that. And as we depart here today, we just pray that we would go in your strength and in your encouragement, knowing that we are loved by you, knowing that we are your people and that we are on a journey that takes us to heaven. So Father, may that make the difference in our lives right now, how we think, our attitudes, how we talk, 
what we do. May we never be discouraged when hardship comes because we know that Jesus will see us through and he will walk beside us till we are someday safely in your hands. God, we love you. May we go this day with your favor and blessing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.